West Virginia is the butt of a lot of jokes from its culture to its people, but what a lot of people do not know is the vast amount of history this small state holds. I'm a huge history fan and one of my favorite parts of West Virginia is this five-mile stretch of the Old Midland Trail National Scenic Byway that follows Route 60 from Malden to Bell. Let's take a drive, stopping at these historical locations and learn a little about what makes West Virginia such a wonderful place. Malden was the location of the first African-American Baptist church which was organized in the 1850s by freed slaves. The leader of this organization was Reverend Lewis Rice or Father to most. In 1865, a temporary structure was built by Lewis Ruffner, the local salt mine owner, and a union general for the church members to meet. By the 1870s, this area was home to over 1,500 African-American laborers during the expansion of the salt and coal industry. With this, the small church outgrew the building, the African Zion Baptist Church was built in 1872 and still remains standing today. This church is a one-story frame structure with a gable roof and bell tower. It is the oldest African-American church in Kanawha County and is nicknamed Mother Church. Reverend Rice passed on August 26, 1902, at the age of 81. There is a monument for him located in the Spring Hill Cemetery in Charleston. This church was added to the National Register of Historic Places in 1974 and tours are still being given today. In 1865, at the age of nine, Booker T. Washington along with his brother, sister and mother, Jane Ferguson, walked 225 miles from Hales Ford, Virginia to join his stepfather, Washington Ferguson, who was working in the salt mines in Malden. Booker worked as a salt packer before becoming a houseboy for Viola Ruffner, the wife of Louis Ruffner. It was during these years, Booker, along with the help of Viola, learned to read, good work ethics and how to become thrifty. In 1872, at the age of 16, Booker entered into the Hampton Agricultural Institute in Virginia. After he graduated, he returned to Malden and taught Sunday school at the African Zion Baptist Church along with classes at the schoolhouse. He also married his second wife, Fanny Smith in 1881. Before leaving Malden for good, Booker purchased a two-story brick home for his sister, Amanda Johnson. Today this park has been created on that site using the old bricks from her home. 
Booker later became skilled in politics and became a confidential advisor to three United States presidents and a major influence on Southern race relations until his death in 1915. Between 1998 to 2000, the West Virginia State College, Booker T., Washington Association, Midland Trail and Cabin Creek Quilts Group worked together to recreate Booker's childhood home and schoolhouse which is open for tours and is located behind the African Zion Baptist Church today. Across the street from the Booker T. Washington Park, you will find the Hale House. This home was built in 1838 and was the home of Dr. John P. Hale who moved from Virginia to Malden in 1840. Once here, he quickly found that medicine was not as interesting as the booming salt business and by 1860, his salt works was thought to be the largest in North America which supplied the meat packing center of Cincinnati, Ohio. Hale served as a surgeon during the Civil War and organized an artillery battery for the Confederate Army fought at Battle of Scary Creek. The salt business collapsed in the 1870s so Hale went on to other interests. He started the first brick-making machinery, built a bank and Charleston's first luxurious hotel called Hale House. He also formed Charleston's first gas company and steam ferry business. Hale went on to become an author who published a pamphlet on Daniel Boone's years in the Kanawha Valley in 1883, Transallegheny Pioneers in 1886 and History of the Great Kanawha Valley in 1891. Hale was the instrumental force in getting the capital of West Virginia moved from Wheeling to Charleston in 1870 and later became the mayor. Most do not know that Hale was also the great-grandson of legendary Mary Draper Ingalls who escaped from the Shawnee and used the Kanoa River to find her way back home to Virginia in 1755. Her story was fictionalized in the novel, Follow the River. Hale was a lifelong bachelor and passed in 1902 at the age of 78. His grave is also in Spring Hill Cemetery and by his orders, was shaped to resemble a small mound, reflecting his interest in the ancient native cultures. His home was restored in 1991.
A little further down the road is the J.Q. Dickinson Salt Works. This business is owned by the seventh generation of salt makers, Nancy Burns and Louis Payne, a brother-sister team who decided to continue the family history. In 1817, Brian was first drilled in the area using hollowed tree truck for pipe walls. By 1850, three million bushels of salt was being produced in one year. In fact, in 1851, London World Fair awarded the best salt in the world to the Great Kanawha Salt. This area was the largest salt-producing region in the United States. The salt at J.Q. Dickinson Salt Works is 100% natural and contains many minerals. Their processing is by letting Mother Nature do most of the work with no machines and instead using good old-fashioned hands to get the job done. You should add this place to your tour and learn about how the brine is pumped up from an ancient ocean underneath the Appalachian Mountains, stored in bed until 100% of the water evaporates which leaves nothing but beautiful salt behind and can be purchased in the store on the property. They are also open to weddings, events, and is known to host amazing farm-to-table meals throughout the year. I didn't stop at this location but on the right, you will find Rand University. You may have learned of this location in the ESPN films, 30 for 30 Rand University. This is the home of Randy Moss, NFL football player who was featured in the film. Our next stop is my old school, DuPont High, home of the Panthers. Built in 1961, DuPont was a high school until it became a middle school in 1999. It is also the high school to some amazing sports players such as Bobby Howard, NFL linebacker, Randy Moss, NFL receiver, and Jason Williams, NBA guard. Although these were great players, you don't hear about all the other amazing ones that played along with them which won our school AAA championship. The memories made here are still talked about today and the school still looks pretty much the same as it did back then.
While you are exploring the historical places in the area, I highly recommend you stop at Bellissimo, which means beautiful in Italian, and grab some lunch. You will not be disappointed. This restaurant is owned by two brothers, AMR and Mohammed Alassal, who moved to the area from Egypt. Their love for cooking is inspired by their mother and you can read about their journey in an article published in the Gazette by the Foo Guy on February 20, 2018. I have been eating here for many years and the casual dining experience along with the amazing food is something you will not forget. They take the time to get to know their customers and you can tell each dish is cooked with love. People travel for hours away just to try this restaurant and they get rave reviews. I personally recommend the garlic knots, Hawaiian pizza, buffalo chicken salad, pepperoni roll, Philly cheesesteak sub with the works and don't forget the homemade ranch dressing. If you don't want to eat lunch indoors on a nice day, get it to go and have a picnic at the Marmot Locks and Dam. The original dam was built in the 1930s but because of increased barge traffic and sizes, a significant change had to be made. A new expansion was built and started operating in 2008. It cut boat traffic from 4 hours to 50 minutes. Two shelters with picnic tables was built and several benches for the area to use. Before the expansion, this area was once covered with homes and a mini mall where I had my first job at Fast Check after school. In 2019, my son, along with many family and friends, built this chimney swift tower as an Eagle Scout project. There is also a group of residents called Friends of Mount Holly Lawn, that is working to get a one-mile looping path put in at the base of the mound. They are wanting it to be an educational path that tells the historical story of the area as you take a nice stroll in a nice wooded area. Cross your fingers that this project goes forward as it would be an amazing addition to the area.
Next, we will just be driving past DuPont plant, although it has had many names over the years. With its vast history, I wanted to add to this tour. Many manufacturing plants started right here. This area produced products to aid in the manufacturing of steel, refining of oil, production of explosives, purification of water, tanning of leather, operation of automobiles and the manufacture of plastics, paper, man-made fibers just to name a few. They are the first producers of synthetic methanol which is used for automotive antifreeze, first producers of commercial fertilizers in the United States, first producers of nylon raw materials, first plant to produce polyethylene and supplied much of these products to the armed forces. The town of Bell was built around the Charleston Steel Company in 1917. This company sold to the government during World War I and turned into a mustard gas plant. This was again sold around 1919 and became the Bell Alkali plant. This company was the first in the valley to turn salt brines into chemicals that was used in many products produced such as hydrochloric acid for pickling. This company also believed in supporting local and participated in many community, social, political and economic endeavors. In 1952 this plant changed hands again to Diamond Shamrock Chemical Company. During World War II, it is worth knowing that Bell Works provided practically all of its products to the war, along with a large number of the younger workers. Many honors was won by these employees in the armed services. The DuPont plant was built in 1925 as a way to meet Americans' need for basic nitrogen compounds for military security and industrial development. There is also a rumor that at one time, a spy was once caught at the plant during the war. This old stone house was built on a 704-acre tract of land given to the area's first settlers, brothers Samuel and John Shrewsbury, by their father-in-law, Colonel John Dickinson in 1798. It was considered a stone mansion in its time. When the Shrewsbury arrived, the area was filled with large black walnut grove trees which was cut down to clear the land for farming and to build log cabins. The grove of trees is now lost but some of the wood can still be seen inside the home. This house was built in the 1800s with stone quarried from the nearby hillside. The home is three stories high with three beautifully crafted fireplaces which you need to see to appreciate. In 1985, the Bell Historical Restoration Society purchased the home and restored the inside. You can now take a tour and explore what this home would have been like during the 1800s between May and October, third Saturday in the month, and learn much more about the history of the home, area, and the family that once lived there. There is a Facebook page where you can find more details about upcoming events.
The little town of Bell was incorporated in 1958 and today has a little over 1,000 residents. It is the home of Bell Elementary built in 1922 with additions being made in 1926. Bell also has a volunteer fire department which was first organized in 1943 over concerns of fire hazards in the growing town. Bell has been hit with hard times these days, but as you drive down the one-mile front street, you can let your imagination wonder to what it must have been like in its heyday. Every storefront opened with mom and pop shops, the streets full of cars and families just out for a stroll. I still have faith that, one day and with the right leadership, this area will have new life breathed into it and it will still have many more historical stories to tell in its future. Thank you for taking the time to listen as we take a little ride through history. I hope you enjoyed learning a little about this 5-mile tour and that you might want to take a day trip to the area and explore it for yourself in the future.